Hi, everybody. Rebecca Nelson, Wine Club Director at Becker Venues, back with you again. Uh, we are here for uh, another vertical taste, another virtual tasting. This is our vertical library week. Uh, so we're so glad that you guys decided to join us for this one. On Monday, we were tasting the 2016 Cabernet Sauvignon Reserve from the Wilma Family Vineyard. And tonight, we're trying the 2015 Cabernet Sauvignon Reserve from the Wilma Family Vineyard. So moving uh, backwards towards the uh, older years and kind of showing you the difference that the ages, the aging has on that and also the different effects that those different uh, growing seasons had on those particular grapes as well. So I really hope that you guys got to try out on Monday and I'm excited for you guys to try this additional vintage here tonight. We have some special guests with us, of course, once again, we have our owner, Dr. Richard Becker. We also have our winemaker, John Leahy. We have our general manager, Brett Pernu, and we also have Jet Wilmoth from the Wilmoth Family Vineyard. So we're really excited to have everybody with us tonight. And I turn it over to you gentlemen to get us all going. Cheers. Cheers, Rebecca. Another fabulous introduction. I'm sorry, I was looking off to the side here because I forgot to click that little live icon on the iPad. So. <laughs> <laughs> and another technical issue. <laughs> hey, uh, welcome, and I am very excited that we have Jet Wilmoth on with us tonight too. Um, Doc, if you would uh, uh, lead us out with a few words, please, sir. Thanks, Sean. And just for, for a moment, concentrating on everything that's happened in our country in the last uh, weeks and months, and uh, and a, a sense that maybe we're going to be more united as a people, which will be a grand thing, something we're going to very much need in order to battle health crisis and financial crisis that, that, that faces us. And uh, I just want to say... Uh, uh, I'm delighted about that, and, and let's have a little wine tasting, a, a, a light moment to think about how things can be better. I I will drink to that one. I'll raise my glass. <laughs> <laughs> and this uh, this handsome gentleman who doesn't seem to be able to smile here on the screen, Mr. Jet Wilmoth. <laughs> so, hey, Jet, I was telling stories on you on Monday, so um, yes, sir. I'm, hoping, I'm hoping we get some uh, interesting questions. <laughs> so. I, uh, I, we, we, you've been on before uh, for a whole, a whole other ball of wax, but you know, right off the bat, I want to mention that you know, three of your wines that we've made have won double golds uh, in the San Francisco International. Um, the uh, this one, of course, is one of them. The the 2015 that we're drinking tonight, and we're very proud of this wine, the winery, and we're very, very um, thankful. I guess very grateful for our relationship with you as a grower. So. Thank you for joining us, taking the time out of your schedule to do that. Uh, just to kick things right off, what do you what do you smell and taste? Let's get everybody a little taste, and then we're going to dive into the history of your vineyards and everything else. So let's give it a swirl, a sniff, and a taste. So what do you think? It's still awesome. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. No, it's it's really uh, full bodied. It's got excellent tannins. Um, in two thousand fifteen, we brought in some pretty good grapes, and uh, y'all did it uh, a fine job making the wine. I I was really excited in fifteen because you know thirteen we we had such a horrible year straight uh, across us, the board. Us. And, 14, we did not get, but maybe half of what we would normally get. I mean, 14 was still a very tough year. And 15 was that, that first year after the 13 freeze that we really started seeing not just quality, but quantity uh, as well coming out there. And we really, when these grapes came in, we knew they were good, but um, man, this just keeps getting better and better every year in the, in the bottle. Um, so the what's your secret what do you do you dance you know at midnight around the vines or what why do you always produce really good cabernet uh it's the soil it's where we're at on the high plains we have excellent sunlight the best quality sunlight you can find mm -hmm. um we have uh, cooler nighttime temperatures for the most part not always but um and I'm remembering back to 14, and that's the year that I burned all the hay and hired the helicopters to come in and push the heat down into the vineyard. And uh, so, so that is 14, but 15 was a somewhat easier year. Mm -hmm. uh, we had some storms roll through, but uh, we managed to uh, dodge the bullet, so to speak, and uh, had a long growing season and turned out 
very profitable and wonderful for everyone involved. So I have a, a quick question that just came across on the internet. Sorry, I looked away there. It just popped up. Okay. I want to know where the, uh, what nursery did you get the vines from that you planted? Um, that was from uh, Cal West. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. you know, West Coast Nursery then. Uh, yeah. Uh, the big root, they called it. Um, that's, that's the older vines. Uh, the younger ones from Vintage. Mm -hmm. And they're uh, um, thinking they're, oh, I'm not sure what rootstock they're on. I failed to do my homework again. <laughs> uh, you don't need to give away all your secrets. <laughs> it's okay, they're still, the, the uh, younger vines are still very healthy and yep. we're going to well, bring some more fruit this year. I, uh, so Doc, I'm going to uh, give you a chance to tell some stories on Jet. So when was the first time you met Jet? And... Uh, I think I think Jeff. Uh, it was either a friend, probably either a grape a grape growers meeting, mm -hmm. uh, or he came to the or just very close to that time. He also came to the winery, mm -hmm. and uh, and I think after maybe our, our first harvest with him, yeah. he he and uh, his wife and a wonderful wonderful company. I want to say about the the, the evaluation of this wine. Uh, yes. The reason I think this one is a gold medal is that it has a lot of, a lot of strength, a lot of. Uh, it's very, it's kind of powerful and it's mm -hmm. subtle, and both on the aromatic and in the in the in the front of the mouth and full palate and after you swallow it, it's sustained. It's a very um, kind of even, complex, uh, interesting presence, and uh, it's really a rare wine. It's like a a Saint Emilion in, in my in my mind. Well, and um, some Cabernet Franc in this, John? No, there isn't. There's just Cabernet and a little bit of Merlot. Um, you think so, that uh, Jeff for, didn't didn't look at the labels and planted some Cabernet Franc <laughs> in his Cabernet? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Jed, no, you can take that first one. <laughs> he's, it's a good thing he's 400 miles away. <laughs> um, no, the uh, unless there is, but it, that Cabernet, um, especially the older block, produces mm -hmm. a really good. Um, uh, it, it does produce some really good bell pepper edge to it. Um, those uh, terpenes are really nice in, in there. Uh, and yes, they are reminiscent of Cab Franc, but I, I always thought really good Cabernet should have a little bit of that edge there because it does mellow out after a few years in bottle, um, but it still has that, uh, that brilliant forward nose to it. So, uh, well, it's, so even, even after you swallow this wine, there's a lingering presence of the taste, you know, which is very, very positive. That, I, think that's, I think that's why it got the great reviews it's, it's gotten. Yeah, I, um, and for those of you, so we just had a couple questions here. One um, about the, uh, why is the double gold so important uh, or something like that? It, it just scrolled past me real quick. But for those of you who may not know, so the, there, there are several international competitions that wineries are, um, you know, can, can join. Two of them, two of the best ones are San Francisco International and the San Francisco Chronicle, both of which have between 50 and 60 judges on the panel. And they taste this wine over several days. So in groups, smaller groups, all of the judges, all 50, 60 plus judges have to vote your, your wine a gold medal in order to get a double gold. Even if one judge declines the gold medal, then you don't get a double gold. You get gold with 94 points or whatever. Um, and they that make sure they, John, that uh, they don't know which wine is which. They have several no, hundred yeah, it's in a, front of them. Yeah, it's a single wine. <laughs> not a double blind. So they do know the varietal. They don't know where it's from. They, they, of course, intellectually, they are aware that they're competing straight across the board from all over the world. You know, at this, this particular one in 2018, I think they had uh, 5,600 entries from around the world. Um, not all of them were Cabernet, but the 5,600 wineries. Now there were several thousand Cabernets that, uh, you know, there are a few double golds awarded, but in uh, 2018 of the, um, of all of the double golds awarded, you know, we, Becker brought home several of those, but in the state, you know, we, I think there was four awarded and we got two of the four awarded in the state of Texas. 
And then of course we did the one thing that <clears throat> nobody else has done and that's four double golds in one year off of our wine ramp on four of the submissions. All four of those got double golds. So that, um, that was really kind of fun too. Um, we, that's only happened one other time internationally. So we do have really world-class grapes here. And I, and I think that's very important, not just to explain about the awards and toot our own horn, but to explain that, you know, we have really good grapes and we have really good talent um, without naming me specifically, but uh, we have really good talent straight across in the state. We have, we have a, uh, a lot more experience coming in. We've got experienced grape growers. We've got people that are collaborating between winery and, and farm that really makes the big difference. And that kind of a great segue too into Jet. Tell us some history about your family farm. I've got two questions here. One wants to know the vines per acre and two wants to know how long y'all been farming as a family. Oh, okay. Nine, 990 plants per acre. Okay. The four by 11 mm -hmm. put between plants, 11 between rows. Um, the family uh, has been on this property since about 1928, this specific property. Mm -hmm. uh, they came up on the High Plains years before that, uh, settled at a little place called Estacada, which is close to Petersburg, Texas. Mm -hmm. um, just uh, had some cattle and had a truck garden at the, in the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, to sustain the family and then uh, started acquiring more land and producing actual crops for commercial uh, sales. So when did you when did you first plant vines and why did you do it? Uh, in 1995 my father passed away and I started thinking about uh, what all this means. Uh, legacy what are we hand? What's he handed to me? What am I going to hand down to my children? Um, and it hit me that we're selling water out here, and we're selling it by the way of a product that you sell. Sure. And uh, a lot of it's too cheap. Our water is so precious, and it's getting more so every year. Right. Uh, so I looked at a lot of different crops. I'd grown many different crops, like thirty different crops. Most of those use a lot more water than uh, we have, or you know, it's becoming uh, harder and harder. So I uh, come upon uh, grapes, and of course my friend Neil Newsom was growing grapes at the time, and he was having some difficulties, but was having success also. Mm -hmm. um, decided that that's what I needed to do, so uh, talked to Neil, and he said, well, there's you know, Cal West, and so we ordered our first five acres worth, and planted them in 2000. Yeah. And learned a lot. <laughs> learned a lot, yeah, right. And I guess. Experience is the best teacher, mm -hmm. or not. And we got a lot of experience that first two or three years, and uh, Cab being the first planted, Merlot the second, the Gewürztraminer of the third, mm -hmm. and on from there. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I've been the beneficiary of your hard work and I, I love the fruit that's coming in here. Um, my, my other favorite variety of yours is of course the Merlot and there's a, a fair portion of that in here. So our, our blend that we have is 73% uh, um, Cabernet and 27% Merlot. And there's, uh, so the Cab and the Merlot are, are yours. Um, they, they do beautifully together. And, um, or I'm sorry, I was getting that backwards. That's not correct. That's yes. 80, we, I'm we sorry, 89. Um, there you go. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Here, <laughs> let me look at that. John. Yeah. John, at 89, 11. Made, John. 89 yeah. and 11. Yeah. I, sorry, I read the wrong line. Yeah. Yeah. Red, red yeah. table on it, John. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, okay. sorry, I was just really focused. Did everybody, did everybody see Doc's graduate high school graduation photo behind him? <laughs> John, you forgot to tell them what the they you know, the first Merlot grapes y'all got from me. Yeah, came in so dark they had never seen Merlot grapes that dark, mm -hmm. and they nicknamed them Jet Black and Jealous. 
Jack, Jack and Dennis. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Okay, so um, you've had a chance to sip and taste this. I want everybody's feedback. Brett, what do you get out of this wine? Well, and I, th I, I mean, I think it's it's coming along, and and we have it at the at the tasting room here, Main Street. We put in a fancy Amadeo Riedel decanter. I can't tell how much of the screen you can see. I, I put it. Um, in decanter yeah i also put it in the in the regular small decanter that doc loves that you know it's the simple kind of merlot decanter and 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 really we were goofing off and there it is doc yep, yep. and that one is doc's is way easier to wash than this one look it's you my know, favorite um, yeah. yeah and and i would definitely say i'm not a big fan of trying to wash this but it's definitely pretty and i think if you have a wine of this caliber it should you know i, I would have a no problem pouring this at a party for my friends out of that decanter but um but I think the the doc's comment that it's 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 got a lot of flavor, but it's soft and it's subtle is probably the reason why I enjoy it so much. And and I typically like, you know, these big bold wines. But we also talk a lot about when we're making wines for our brand is that we don't want it to be a fruit bomb or oak bomb, or an alcohol bomb. And I think that that's what this is. This was what it's currently doing. And and yet I'm going to tell you like I I got to I got to type up this um this agenda for today. And as I was going through there, I'm like, holy cow, this one won this, this one won that, this one won. I mean, it's just been amazing over the years that we've had this, this relationship that we've been able to do this as long as what we have, you know, so kudos to you, you know, <laughs> regardless <laughs> what, <laughs> yeah. So I, um, I'd like to get back. So doc, um, the, one of the, I think one of the best things and, and certainly uh, uh, one of the most enjoyable things I've gotten to do uh, as winemaker at, at, at Becker Vineyards is, is go to some of these dinners and help promote the wine, but also go to these award dinners. And one of those um, a couple of years ago was at uh, uh, the James Beard house in, in Manhattan. And we served the jet here alongside with food from Johnny Hernandez. So doc, talk a little bit about the James Beard, what that means to people, um, what that means for us, to people who may not be familiar with it, and then how many times have we actually gone, our wine have gone to the John Beard? Well, it's a, uh, the beer dinners are generally a special invitation to a chef or group of chefs around the country. And they uh, they bring, the chef comes to, to New York and, and cooks in the Beard Kitchen. And the James Beard Kitchen uh, is about, what would you say, Brett, about, uh, Eight feet by sixteen feet. I mean, it's a, it's an, yeah. it's an amazing. It's I was so gonna small. Say like eight, eight by ten. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's very tiny, and uh, out of that kitchen comes you know the the, the best food that this. They're all famous chefs that uh, can cook, and uh, this was especially good because uh, we were with with Steve McHugh, Elizabeth Johnson, and and Johnny from San Antonio uh, on this time. I think we have. Brett and I are not sure if, if we've done a dozen or 14 di dinners. And mm -hmm. these are all dinners where the chef was invited and then the chef uh, uh, chose our wine to be part of that. And certainly that was from Tom and Lisa Perini's initiation a number of years ago. Been very, it's been very meaningful to us, but it's, it's wonderful to have that experience. And uh, in the audience will be a lot of, usually a lot of writers, uh, people from the New York Times every time I've been, uh, it's it's a, a wonderful opportunity for us to be on, on a stage like that in New York, uh, but this was especially especially great dinner because all San Antonio people, and uh, and some great wine, including this. I thought this was the this was with the main course. It was it was wonderful. Yes, it it really it really was. Um, yeah, and then any excuse to to actually sit down and enjoy some uh, some food from Johnny is just absolutely a fantastic. So the um, next thing, so Brett, you're going to have to help me too because I, I'm going off of my tiny screen. The um, the gold medal for for the 2015. Mm -hmm. um, the that was the chronicle. No, that was the yeah. That was on. I, yeah, I have it up here. So the gold for the 15. Um, and I and again we go back to this vineyard and in my notes I have the 20 the 2015 won the double gold, then the 2017 followed it up again with a double gold right. in 2019 and right. then it also got a gold medal in the in the in the sf san francisco chronicle okay it okay. got a gold in 2020 um and 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 again we just keep going on about this and you know jet i you know 
we we love your grapes we love the grapes we're getting from the other 12 to 14 growers that we're we're purchasing fruit from but the ultimate thing is is that when the question that john read off like what does the the double gold mean well it means a lot of things to different people but for us i think it means that well we can compete with wines of the world um it validates the fact that you've done so much hard work miss canada did so much hard work our estate vineyard that was in the reserve like so that four pack it was drew talent the canadas the wilmas the the readies the talents um the farmhouse vineyard like almost we could we could take that swath of all of our growers and say you guys all had a part in this and we love to give everybody a name on a vineyard bottle but at the same time it's about a 50 50 split currently for what gets a vineyard designate versus what doesn't and the validation in that one year was just pretty neat. And Doc could tell the story about the, the Hearst Media Group coming in uh, to the winery to have a lunch one day. Uh, and I think that they were kind of shocked in the fact that we won four double golds in that in that year. And they kind of showed up saying, what's happening? I actually thought that they were coming to buy the winery, you know, so that was my take on it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but but it was kind of cool that I mean it, it was definitely something that when we sit back and the bottom line for me is is it's only as good as what the wine's worth and I think that it validates the fact that that these vineyards that we've been buying from for many years are of worldly quality. It's not just because it's from Texas; it's world class wine, and so that's why we are so excited about the these different awards. Oh yeah, I, I absolutely. Um, but you know the the other thing too is. Being able to build a program consistently, same vineyard year after year after year, um, it, as a winemaker, that's one of the, the few things you really want to see, dealing with the same fruit from the same vineyard. You get to know what's going on in the vineyard. You get to know the grower. Um, you, you establish good rapport. But in there, the, then the grower has multiple years to see what you're doing with the fruit that they're growing. And there's always those aha moments like, oh, okay, I understand why Jet's doing this now. This, I can see the visible results here. Uh, you know, it's, that's what makes a, a world-class wine is something with time. You know, and that's something you can't replicate. You can't speed it up. You can't, you know, put an additive into a wine to make it feel like or be like, you know, and I, I always get a kick out of these articles I read about the latest and greatest technology has finally broken that mold and they can create any wine in the world, you know, a great Bordeaux or, you know, an interesting, you know, uh, Priorat. But what they can't do is recreate that relationship you have with a grower as a winemaker. And I think that's the one thing that um, is really important is that I get to, to talk to Jet. I can ask him anything. He may make fun of me on occasion, but he will <laughs> always answer the question. So, <laughs> but, um, and leading into that Jet, so you, you, you talked about uh, after your father passed away and what it meant for the legacy and stuff. So um, who's gonna take over the farm when you decide to retire? Retire? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? what? He's like, yeah. Uh, well, I have a, a daughter and a son-in-law, and they're they're thinking about uh, strongly coming in and being a big part of this. And uh, uh, my middle child, my younger daughter, uh, April, she's working on her doctorate in uh, occupational therapy. Uh, special needs kids is what she's concentrating on, mm -hmm. and uh, so she's probably going to stay with that. Uh, my son is chemical engineer at XFAB, and he's constantly saying, well, my, one of these days I'll, I'll be back and we'll, you know, and I'm like, hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, all that said, we, we've got some plans coming on and uh, continue this. And uh, we've got to get through this uh, October spell we had last year, this October freeze. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we've got to retrain some stuff and get to, uh, things reestablished um and it's gonna take some time but we'll we'll do it we, it takes horsepower and uh we've got it so we'll be we'll be back all good that's that's all good i so speaking of, okay speaking of weather um since we have you here on grower wednesday and we are going to taste the 2014 on friday and we just got the 2016 could you would you just give me a few words um like the your impressions of the weather and the harvest for each the 16, the 15, and the 14. Um, so people on Friday, we can reference that. Okay, so uh, in 14, uh, after I burned, the, saved the crop in the beginning, and we got it going in the year, and 
I, I do petty old tests that tell me, you know, what, what uh, chemical analysis we've got going on in the veins of the plant. Mm -hmm. And uh, we saw that there was a little bit of uh, micros that we were missing. Uh, we didn't have an abundance of, they were, you know, a little bit lacking. So mm -hmm. um, in 15, in the spring of 15, uh, actually fall of 14, we applied compost, also applied a little bit of potassium uh, at the base of the plant. And uh, the next year when we started doing patios, we saw those numbers were back up to where they were supposed to be. And that leads into, I think, how the 15 and the 16 became, and the 17 became world-class winners uh, because we were filling all the needs of the plant. And uh, that keeps the plant healthy and it uh, keeps uh, all the special little things that it takes to go into those berries to do that photon and the, you know, the energy of photon of light comes in and hits and produces the carbohydrates, mm -hmm. which goes into the fruit. But you know, uh, don't you all those things lined up, then you, you have a better chance of making okay, but like what one of the things is like was 15 a wet or a dry year was for what was 14 versus 15 as far as weather goes okay so 14 we had a fair amount of uh moisture yeah and uh it, it was just enough it wasn't you know a deluge uh like y'all get down in uh, east texas but uh I, I call it hill country east texas <laughs> uh <laughs> wow we, uh in 15, we didn't get quite as much rain during the growing season. Uh, we did have to dodge some bullets there at harvest time. We had some storms, uh, as you know, they roll in and it, it can look like it's gonna miss and it hits or, or it looks like it's gonna come and it misses. It's just luck of the draw. In 15, uh, we were able to dodge the bullets. Uh, the storms went around and we got to harvest all night long and get the fruit into the chilled truck and get it to y'all in timely fashion. All that, all this plays into a success, successful project. Sure. If any of that glitches, not so good. Okay, so, so we, we, know you, we, we, know you, we know you know how to grow fruit. Now, what I wanna ask uh, Dr. Becker is doc, um, why, why Cabernet for our lead lineup at, at Becker? Uh, we know Roans do really well, but what is it, a special passion about Cab that you have? I love Cabernet. <laughs> so that's, uh, I think that's where we started. And I know when we started planting grapes, the uh, conventional wisdom was, uh, you know, you, you can't grow Cab, you've got to grow a Rhone varietal uh, mm -hmm. or, 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 or something from Spain. and. Uh, and then here we've got all these wonderful prizes with Cabernet and Chardonnay and Merlot and Cabernet Franc. Uh, I think that's nonsense. Uh, I think, and I know that uh, there's been a fair amount of comparison between the high plains where Jet is and the number of luminols in a in a in a growing season, very very comparable with Bordeaux. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the real proof in the pudding is the wine. And if you can make a wine this good, I think if you put this out in a blind tasting. If, in, in Bordeaux with, with winemakers, they, they would, they'd be amazed. They'd be mystified about this wine. Well, I, I, I think it is a, absolutely um, a fantastic example of Cabernet. Personally, I, I, I do. I think the High Plains has great Cabernet. There's no so I have a question. I don't, I've never been to France. What's the elevation in the areas where they grow Cab there? Uh, in Bordeaux, about six or seven feet above sea level. Um, <laughs> that's not actually true. We're closer to the sun. Na, 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 na. <laughs> that's why I'm sunburned, Jet. Look, from coming to your house two weeks ago. <laughs> well, it's you just... know the, the the main river does dump into the into the ocean. Um, they, you know, it's. Um, I'm not sure what the highest elevation there is. I know it. it uh, it's very similar to Northern California as far as the ocean temperate yeah. for the climate there. Um, Doc, you've, you've been there. What's... Well, I think what Bordeaux really has going for it is the Gulf Stream. You know, it's farther north and you should be able to grow these grapes. And That's the great. Gulf Stream comes around and, and 
comes into that part of France and um, makes and dry, it makes the temperature sufficiently warm that you can grow grapes and have them hang for a long time in a very moderate climate. The Romans recognized this 2,000 years ago, and there was very active uh, grape growing and wine production in Bordeaux uh, at the time of Christ, 2,000 years ago. And the wine was made and, and shipped back to Rome. So it's, uh, it's, this is, they observed this very early, probably without knowing anything about the Gulf Stream. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, we're, we're at that, uh, that great, um, the, uh, that great moment in time, and I'm going to lead off with Jet. Jet, what, what would you pair with this Bordeaux of yours? What would you, uh, what food would you put with this Cabernet? Um, ribeye. Mm-hmm. And a little more ribeye. Okay. And probably a little more ribeye. Ribeye. <laughs> the ribeye. So for you, you. Dessert, for dessert, I would have some dark chocolate. Yes. Any form. Dark okay. Chocolate. Top of her. Dark chocolate and ribeye. All right. It sounds like. It. So Brett, what would? Uh, no tenderloin. No. Listen, I got, I got you a good one, and and I'm totally copping this from our trip to New York. So. Uh, when we ate at the James Beard House, uh, Johnny Hernandez co uh, cooked the mesquite uh, barbecued. And John, you're the barbecue guy, but it was mesquite smoked goat. That's oh, what we yeah. had. At, at, yeah. So the, I'm going to I'm going to take his recommendation. You know, world class yeah, chef. I'm going to I'm going to steal it. Yeah, there, that's hard to beat. It was pretty damn good. Yeah. It was tasty. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. So Doc, what what about you? What food? Well, I, I always remember that we were uh, we were in the in the Dordogne. River Valley in, in Bordeaux uh, in a very tiny little hotel, probably had 20 rooms uh, on a cliff, a thousand feet above the Dordogne River Valley. Mm -hmm. And we had, we had dinner in the hotel restaurant that night uh, and we had duck confit with, with uh, a, a Bordeaux. And that was the best pairing I've ever tasted. That was recommendation of the uh, sommelier. And uh, that's, that, that'll always be memorable. This particular wine with duck confit, I think would be just great. That that does sound great. Well, I'm gonna kind of go down that road too because uh, I've uh, I've had great great cab and roasted goose. So um, that that darker meat is really nice. That that fattiness goes very very well with this. Um, but Jet, you know, we actually made a really interesting discovery in our bites menu that we do with, uh, for people that come in for the the bites pairing that we do food and and uh, wine pairing. Uh, Chef Michael made this really small lemon cake with lemon icing on it. And we just by accident had it with this wine. You know, lemon and, and cab shouldn't go together. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. Brett can back me up on this. We took a bite. We were tasting this. And we're like, what the hell is this? It's un unbelievable. The, it was like it was like rock star good yet. It had a little mint, a little salt on top of it. It was just ridiculous. It, it so. was ridiculous. It, it broke every rule in the book, and it was just absolutely fantastic. And that really um, kind of led the way on. We need to be a little more about rule breaking with pairings, just to see what they'll do. You know, I've come across some bad ones, but you know, your your cabernet goes really well with a variety of desserts. So <laughs> if anybody uh, doesn't uh, want uh, a sweet uh, bite, uh, you know, well, not great lemon the juice, buddy. We're not talking about doing lemon cello shots. You know? so, <laughs> just a little cake there. Uh, John, John I, I want a, uh, I want everyone to comment on a non-Texas wine this reminds them of. Uh, and I'll start with Lynch Bosch. Um, and it'll be a different blend than, than this Cabernet Merlot blend. But somehow what you put together here reminds me, I love Lynch Bosch. Mm -hmm. And uh, Brett, uh, Jet, John, is there a California or French wine that, that sort of this kind of wakes up the, the memory of when you taste it? Wow. Jet, you want to go first? No. No. <laughs> I don't have as much experience as y'all. I'm, I'm running. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Well, no, I think, no, I think I've had wines and I, I do think that our wines tend to be more kind of in the mid palette with in, in comparison to the big California reds. And I do think that, you know, like when you, when you taste these wines that are in balance um, and doc, you probably taught me this more than anybody that like, I mean, the wines that are, you know, 15.2% alcohol might have this big, huge note in them. But I think that the balance in this, I, I think for Cabernet, 
I think I can think of Stag's Leap, um, Artemis that would, you know, it's probably one of those that it might get a little bigger than this. I agree. You know? Yeah, good call. I, um, I'm going to go further down Valley from, from Brett and on the other side of the highway, um, because this really reminds me of a 92 cake bread Cabernet. Um, I so, yeah, Rutherford, um, that red, that red Rutherford dust. Um, uh -huh. I, I, you know, that or bond the second label, um, by uh, Harlan estate, um, uh -huh. that, uh, there are some really similar qualities to that. So yeah, I'll, I'll go new world on this one without a problem. Hey, and I want to interrupt real quick because next week um, we're going to have a fairly um, high-profile winemaker on with us on Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. My screen just went blank. Sorry, my battery's <laughs> going dead. Um, high-profile winemaker with us on Wednesday night uh, next week with our Unita blend from the Coppola family vineyard. Mm -hmm. uh, I do want to mention that, and if you haven't got that Coppola pack for next week, you need to order it quickly. Um, or you can order it late and still get it and watch it later. But uh, Corey Beck, the winemaker for Coppola, and John, I forget all the properties that he makes wine for, but it's pretty extensive. And it was neat for us to do this collaboration, the collab of the uh, Texas Cab versus the, or with the California Cabs. And, and, I, and I think that, you know, this, this, this is a neat thing that we're going to do with them next, next Wednesday. So definitely get that one. But where, John, again, where's he made wine at? Um, um, well, yeah, I mean, Corey's been making wine for God forever. His grandfather uh, grew grapes for Chateau Montalena. Um, huh? And, you know, Corey grew up the vineyards in northern uh, Calistoga area in, in northern Napa Valley. Uh, his background, of course, he went to Davis, um, you know, the rock star track. And I have to tease him every time I see him because he, <laughs> he is just this very mellow, very even keeled guy, extraordinarily nice. Um, so you try to say something to get a rise out of him and he just kind of shakes his head. You know, it's like, I live in the most beautiful place in the world. I'm cool. It's all good. But his, yeah. um, That's what I'm brand, he used to make, <laughs> what? Like meditate. What did you say? I said, that's what I'm doing. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Why is it called Tokyo, Jeff? Tokyo? Yeah. Why yeah. is it named Tokyo? There's a lot of different things that's been said. But it's supposed to be an old Indian term means friendly. That's friendly. Huh. Huh. Friendly. Huh. Really? Yeah. <laughs> well, um, so yeah, so Wednesday will be great. But um, Corey currently, the, I, I'm probably wrong about this, but the family Coppola brand, I think, incorporates six different um, wineries currently. So, but Corey's been making wine since mid 90s. Um, yeah. So he's, he's been around for quite some time. And that little place that they took us around called Ingle Nook, you know, you know. Yeah, it's a, a really deal. small place. <laughs> Valley, been there, yeah. That uh, actually uh, was an interesting property. Uh, uh, a lady that I got to meet and uh, absolutely one of the most fantastic women in Napa Valley is uh, Robin Lale. And her um, uh, grandfather, of course, and her father uh, uh, ran that. And uh, she grew up on that property. Um, so she has her own brand, she and her husband. Um, but the, uh, the stories, uh, you know, there, there's just a few families that have been there forever. It's, it's a lot like here. I mean, there are a few families growing grapes. I mean, it seems like there's a huge amount of people there, but it really is a small community, um, and filled with really wonderful people just like here. I, that's the thing about wine. And that's the thing about the wine industry. The wine growing areas tend to attract some of the same personalities. They're, they're, that's what right. makes yeah. Texas so great here it's because of the true. Yeah. So anyway, um, I get, we got the food pairings done. I, the battery just went out on my um, iPad, so I can't see any more of the questions. There was one last question um, uh, directed towards Jet, and I, I'm probably, I'm just going to paraphrase this, Jet, because I can't remember the exact question, but what makes you such a great grape grower? Um, well, uh, I have this tremendous ability mm -hmm. to do the right things. <laughs> well, hey, can, can I, oh hey. yeah, oh no, it's the it's the sunlight, it's the soil, oh. our elevation here. Uh, it's a you know, not a lot of humidity. It's a lot of those things that's making this thing work. Uh, I just have to get 
don't do anything stupid, you know. No, no, Jeff, it's all about driving 90 miles an hour through your vineyard. Yeah, no and doubt, buddy. Every time we get in the truck. <laughs> the, grapes, the grapes are terrified. <laughs> sometimes. As are the passengers. Yeah, sometimes backwards in my case. That's yeah. awesome. Right? I, I, I have never seen a man, oh, we'll just hit, we're just going to go slow, and all of a sudden it's just like zoom. Yeah. Right? One, one, one clod could take out 80 vines before you could hit the brake. Yeah. But, oh, my goodness. Y'all are just but, <laughs> but, John, I want to answer, answer that question that you asked Jed. I think that Jet could grow anything yes. that, that requires, you know, the photosynthesis of the world. And every time I go up there, he gives me a test. You know, and and he asked, and I usually fail them considerably about how you make, you know, so West Texas, Jet, you were talking about how much the wind blows or the wind was blowing yesterday. And he's like, how do you hold the sand down? And I'm like, I don't know. You know, he goes, you make bricks. So when the, well, I remember the growers, <laughs> yeah, yeah. When the growers in the high plains have to deal with the drought, they have to deal with the rain. I do think that Jet, I'm, uh, I think you could grow anything along with a lot of our other growers. So like, I'm, I'm gonna give you a lot of kudos, but I think that the, the farmer's will in this is what's prevailing. Yeah. And I think that that's why these wines are so good, you know? Well, we, I, we should not forget that, that Jed was, uh, had a great teacher. He was Mrs. Yeah. Canada's student. That's yeah. Brenda Canada. was. Miss <laughs> <laughs> Canada tried to teach me to type. <laughs> How'd you do? <laughs> I got through. I got. I got up to seventy uh, a minute uh, without mistakes, and I, there's there's enough of that. So uh, no, I learned uh, chemistry and biology, botany, zoology, entomology uh, at Texas Tech, and in Plains High School also. But uh, I had a lot of uh, people that were patient with me, but I learned by listening. And that's, you know, it's just awesome to learn stuff and education. Mm -hmm. uh, all the different crops that I've grown, each one of them came with an education. The, the important thing about every crop, row crops especially, the harvest equipment is what makes it, that's the distinction. Mm -hmm. Plant it with the same planter maybe, you plow it, you know, with the plows, but harvest equipment is the unique factor in each one of those row crops. Okay, so I didn't get my wine yet, the Coppola stuff, Brett. Oh, I'll ship it to you, Jet. You can. Okay. Uh, <laughs> hey, um, Jet, just real quick before we sign off, do you, is your motorcycle still parked in your living room? No, no, my wife has <laughs> 15 years now, has finally said enough, and it's in the garage or the it's barn. The uh, <laughs> yeah, I was, I'm sad that, uh, that <laughs> yeah, I, I'm certain. I'm certain that Mr. Coppola wants you in his next movie. I've heard rumors about that. I, oh, oh. Sure. Yeah. in an air balloon. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we're only riding in an air balloon, and uh, yeah, <laughs> the premise of the whole movie. Yeah. 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 Well, awesome. But well, listen, uh, Jet. I, again, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, I'm I'm very happy to talk to you. And I'm sure we'll be talking re again real soon, considering what time of the year it is. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> we're we're going to have another glass of wine, and we're going to talk. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We'll, I'm sure we'll figure it out. All <laughs> right. Keep, keep it up, Jeff. Yeah. Don't blame. Yeah. Thank y'all. Thank y'all very much. It's awesome to hear comments from y'all. It, it pumps me up a little bit, but I, the weather will bring me back down. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> thank y'all for all you do and uh blessings it's, to you and yours thanks it's, 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 to everybody yeah. out there cheers great health good wine and may you all have a wonderful rest of the week we'll see everybody here on friday and don't forget our father's day pack up and uh don't forget the wines the canada vertical for father's day as well so cheers cheers bless all the customers out there for keeping on coming <laughs>